My name's Rebecca. I weigh three and a half kilos and measure 54 centimeters. I'm a newborn babe. Behind the screens, my digital double is also being born. In terms of bytes, Rebecca is spelled 010-100-10011. I now have two identities, one real, one virtual. Internet. For my dad, it's now a matter of course. He takes a photo, writes a mail, clicks, and it's gone. Just like magic. But how does the information travel? In order to exist, does the virtual me need infrastructures and energy? And what if all that had an impact on our planet? Once upon a time, there was email. My dad writes about 50 a day. But what does he know of the digital world and the long journey his words make between two clicks of the mouse? The truth about internet is elsewhere. It's hidden between our sidewalks submerged in our rivers, buried in the seabed. The information routes are full of damp and dust. Internet qui apparaît un peu comme un concept très virtuel. On parle de cyberspace, c'est quelque chose qui paraît très nébuleux, très flou. Eh bien, c'est avant tout une infrastructure de réseau, une infrastructure lourde. C'est des millions de kilomètres de cuivre, des millions de kilomètres de fibre optique. From one computer to another, digital data travels an average of 15,000 kilometers at the speed of light. In milliseconds, it passes through an unbelievable maze of IT infrastructures across the planet. My email leaves my computer and goes into my box. From there, it goes downstairs and joins the other emails in the neighborhood on the sidewalk before heading to the internet switching center, the first point on the network. This building is the gateway to the internet. Here, my email switches from my private cable to national and international cables. A bit like leaving a country road for the highway. From this point, it starts to seem like a round-the-world trip. The data can take thousands of different routes, via Japan or the UK, for example. On its long journey, it's directed by routers, the network signaling boxes. First stop, the USA, at the host of email service provider, in my case, Gmail, but it could be Hotmail or Yahoo. In this factory, known as a data center, my email is treated, stocked, and finally redirected, because still at the speed of light, it does the whole journey in reverse right into the addressee's inbox. 
sending an email isn't as magical as it seems. Behind all the appearances, there's a big bill to pay, that of the energy needed to keep internet working. And that hasn't escaped the attention of ADEM. The Agency for the Environment and Energy Control has calculated the energy costs of all we do digitally. Le résultat sur un mail donc avec une, une pièce jointe, c'est à peu près, euh, pour donner un équivalent, une ampoule basse consommation de forte puissance hein, une, donc, euh, qui fonctionnerait pendant, pendant une heure. Donc c'est pas énorme, mais quand même, euh, si on multiplie ça par le nombre d'utilisateurs, le nombre de mails, etc., euh, ça fait quand même des, des petits ruisseaux font des grandes rivières. So, sending an email with an attachment needs 24 watts per hour, a light bulb burning for an hour. Without an attachment, it's on average 5 watts per hour. Fine, but every hour, 10 billion emails are sent. Hard to calculate the total? Let's look at some equivalences. 10 billion emails at an average of 50 gigawatts per hour, equivalent to the electricity production of 50 nuclear power plants for one hour. Or, if you prefer, 4,000 tons of oil. 4,000 Paris-New York round trips by plane. All that for an hour of swapping emails on the web. And that's not including what else we can do on the web. <laughs> to keep Google alone running, it takes as much electricity as for the whole city of Bordeaux. What is the population of Paris, France? Paris population is 2,234,105. This happened in a fraction of a second, and it happens billions of times every day. So there's a lot of work going on inside the data centers to make that happen for you. Spread throughout the world, data centers have become the strategic temples of our digital economy. They are ultra-sensitive places as the digital data of all of us is treated there. From the outside, nothing distinguishes them from a standard hangar, except, perhaps, the surveillance cameras that keep the curious at bay. But behind these bland facades, data centers consume phenomenal amounts of electricity. These internet factories run day and night with no interruption. Inside, tens of thousands of computers treat financial transactions, calculate our taxes, and sort our photos. Places like these have the Internet's greatest energy needs. Un data center, c'est le centre qui produit des data. Donc en fait, c'est une usine numérique et une usine qui prend de l'information, qui la transforme et qui rend de l'information. C'est la capacité, dans un même endroit, dans un building, d'héberger euh, des centaines et des milliers d'ordinateurs, de faire en sorte que ces ordinateurs euh, soient interconnectés dans le monde entier. Les serveurs n'ont pas le look de votre ordinateur chez vous. Ils ont, on les appelle des pizza box. Ils, ont, ils, ont, ils sont très plats et profonds comme ça, et on les installe de cette manière-là. Vous pouvez en mettre environ une quarantaine. Dans cette salle, il y a plusieurs centaines de baies, et on a quatre salles comme ça, où il y a plusieurs milliers de baies en tout dans le data center. You've surely already noticed, when you work with a laptop on your knees, it gets hot. Now, imagine the heat produced by these tens of thousands of machines stacked up side by side. En quelques minutes, la température peut monter ici sans climatisation euh, de 22 à 28 ou 30. Et ça, les serveurs n'aiment pas du tout. To stop the computers overheating, there is round-the-clock air conditioning. These massive cooling systems account for 40% of a data center's electricity bill. Pour vous donner une idée, une climatisation comme ça suffirait largement à refroidir un hôtel de 50 chambres. 
Et nous, il nous en faut des dizaines. A data center is made up of computers connected to a network with one, a flow of digital data, and two, a flow of electric current. The computer's jobs, because they do work, produce heat. So there needs to be a third flow of cold air to keep them cool. This combination is extremely energy consuming. In a single day, one data center alone consumes as much energy as 30,000 citizens. Electricity is what fuels the internet, but it's also its Achilles heel. In data centers, there is one haunting fear, losing digital data. Les serveurs des clients ne peuvent pas tomber ne serait-ce qu'une seconde parce que les impacts sont en millions ou milliards d'euros. Quand vous allez voir un site web, vous voulez qu'il soit disponible. Si physiquement, l'ordinateur ne fonctionne pas parce qu'il n'a plus d'électricité, parce qu'il n'est pas refroidi, et bien vous n'aurez pas votre site web. Le niveau de disponibilité qui est attendu de la part des data centers est équivalent désormais à celui qu'on attend dans le milieu hospitalier ou dans le milieu du transport aérien. On ne supporte pas, évidemment, qu'un avion se crache. Eh bien, on ne supporte plus désormais qu'un data center se crache. To avoid a digital crash, all equipment is doubled or sometimes tripled. If one machine were to go down, another would then take over. Some might call it paranoia or even wastage, but here it's prosaically named redundancy. Ce ne sont pas juste les disques durs qu'on va devoir sécuriser ou multiplier, c'est toute la partie distribution d'énergie, secours d'énergie, production de froid, distribution de froid. Tous ces moyens-là devront être sécurisés pour que aucun élément de la chaîne ne soit fragile. Donc ça demande beaucoup de moyens et ces moyens consomment tous de l'énergie. On fait des métiers de parado. Il faut toujours se dire que quelque chose peut arriver de manière à faire le travail nécessaire pour que ça n'arrive pas. Alors là, on entre, on arrive dans, dans l'antre des bêtes. Redundancy means an even bigger energy burden. Electricity for backup is provided by generators. Their 3,000 horsepower motors are capable of propelling a sea cruiser. Here, there are 10 of them, ready to spark up at a quarter turn. It's in these huge factories that my digital identity is hosted. I must admit, it's a strange cradle for a baby, a digital cradle. I'm now one month old, and I've gained a kilo in weight. As for my digital double, it's tending to grow a little faster than I am. Si on calcule le poids numérique de Rebecca, il y a 582 mégas de photos. Il y a 433, 440 mégas pour le faire part. Et il y a 40 mégas de playlist musicale. Ça nous donne bon, un peu plus d'un giga. Ça va vite. Je pense qu'en fait, ça va aller de plus en plus vite. Ça, c'est ce que j'ai sauvé des, des multiples trucs. Donc moi, petit, tu vois, j'ai... Euh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, j'ai 9 photos. Tu vois, c'est quand même pas la même chose, quoi. Moi, j'ai 9 photos de moi bébé et elle en a déjà 100. Parce que là, on a déjà un rapport de 1 à 10. Quoi. The volume of data in circulation doubles every two years. It's what's known as big data. Today, in one minute, a hundred hours of videos are posted on YouTube. Two million searches made on Google. 
and 680,000 messages posted on Facebook. Remember, one hour of emailing consumes the equivalent of 4,000 round trips from Paris to New York by plane. So tomorrow, what will be the Internet's energy cost? The bytes are piling up, and it's in part due to the fact that anything can now be digitalized. Là, ça c'est le, le coffre à antiquité. Donc là, on a encore des, des mini disques, des DVD en dessous et des CD quoi. En gros, c'est ce qu'on n'a pas donné encore. C'est un peu le dernier truc dont on a du mal à se séparer. On l'a pas ouvert depuis qu'on a déménagé. C'est des, des, des vieux trucs quoi. My folks don't listen to CDs anymore. They have playlists. They don't receive letters, only emails. But because of storing all this data, their hard disks are full. So, Apple, Spotify, and Google now offer to store our data for us in a new cyberspace. They've given it a cute name. The Cloud. A poetic name. Nice and fluffy, and somewhat dreamy. But basically, it just means our data is stored in their data centers. Everything is supposedly virtual, and we don't even have our own files in our homes. Il n'y a plus besoin d'avoir, de posséder une immense CD tech, DVD tech. Ça ne m'apporte rien. Par contre, accéder à une immensité de musique partout en permanence me rend vachement plus service. On donne des pièces ou des hangars de plus en plus grands aux utilisateurs et les utilisateurs entassent leurs affaires, mais dans des volumes exponentiels dans ces hangars, sous prétexte qu'il y a de plus en plus de place. Alors, il y a de plus en plus de place et c'est gratuit. Cette gratuité donne l'illusion que derrière, c'est dématérialisé. Non, ce n'est pas dématérialisé, c'est matérialisé dans un data centre. Data centers which are built fast and which require even more energy. The northern suburbs of Paris. Aubervilliers, Pantin, La Courneuve, Saint-Denis. These districts have traditionally been the stage of industrial revolutions. They were home to polluting glass, steel, then chemical factories. History is now repeating itself. The northeast of Paris today has a majority of data centers built in France. Aubervilliers has become the showcase for this digital revolution. On a six data centers sur la ville. Voilà. Ce qui est, oui, ce qui, ce qui fait dire d'Aubervilliers que c'est la ville des data centers. Ça le fait en affichage politique. Voilà. Mais on ne les voit pas, donc ils passent complètement inaperçus. On les découvre quand on va gratter dans ces grosses boîtes pour savoir qu'est-ce qu'il y a. The suburbs have everything to gain. In 2011, data centers brought in 1.5 million euros in professional tax to Aubervilliers and Saint-Denis. They have also enabled them to rejuvenate old abandoned industrial land. Là, on a l'exemple type de l'industrie de base d'Aubervilliers, des grands entrepôts oui. industriels et maintenant complètement vide. Et, oui. et là-bas, c'est... Mais ça, c'est le grand entrepôt neuf, en fait, qui est de l'autre côté. Ah oui, d'accord. For almost a century, this copper cutting factory was the pride of the first French industrial revolution. It employed hundreds of workers. Tomorrow, the bolts will be replaced by immaterial data managed by a mere dozen employees. On va conserver ce petit bâtiment et on va le remettre en valeur. Le reste, on va le raser. Et à la place de ça, on va construire un grand bâtiment. Moi, je porte l'ambition d'une région parisienne 
euh, en concurrence, on peut le dire, euh, avec Londres, euh, Tokyo, euh, New York, euh, Shanghai. Et aujourd'hui, les grandes métropoles euh, mondiales, elles sont traversées par des flux immatériels, euh, des, des données. C'est ça l'économie euh, aujourd'hui des grandes métropoles. Aubervilliers dreams of becoming a digital megalopolis like Shanghai or London. But the deployment of these digital factories is beginning to weigh on the suburbs' electricity grid. On a l'équivalent de la population d'Aubervilliers en consommation électrique consommée uniquement par les data centers. Alors quand on lit ça, forcément, c'est impressionnant. Euh, Jusqu'à maintenant, ça ne nous posait pas de problème, euh, sauf que. Évidemment, l'économie euh, numérique euh, croissant, euh, là, ERDF commence à dire, euh, ça commence à chauffer dans les tuyaux. Distributing electricity requires infrastructures. With the development of data centers in the Paris region, the infrastructures here need several million euros of investment. Nous alimentons entre autres des data centers. En Ile-de-France, nous en avons 35 à peu près. Et aujourd'hui, ces data centers consomment 200 MW, ce qui est l'équivalent d'une ville de 200 000 habitants. Quand je me projette à 3-4 ans, ces mêmes data centers devraient consommer le double à peu près. Et si on se projette dans 10 ans, 10 ans, 12 ans, on devrait avoir quasiment une multiplication par, par 5 de cette demande. Then there is nothing really virtual about our mouse clicks. This energy requirement could have an impact on our planet. In France, nuclear power supplies our greedy data centers, an energy that's supposedly clean and inexpensive. In the US, home of the pioneers of digital, it's a very different story. America hosts the majority of the world's data centers. There, a frenetic race for energy has begun. Since 2007, the big players have been invading the North Carolina fields. This is Facebook. A few miles away is Apple. A little farther, home of another web giant, Google. The data centers of three alone use 5% of North Carolina's electricity. In search of the internet, here we are in North Carolina. We're getting close. I must begin to hear the servers running. Gary Cook is a Greenpeace activist specializing in climate change. But instead of observing the melting of glaciers, Gary is closely monitoring the increase in data centers and their impact on the environment. That's big. Best viewpoint we can find. And that's where uh, a big piece of the internet is running right behind us. We have been focused on IT companies because, for a number of reasons, um, for data centers like these um, here, they're drawing a lot of, they're the source of a lot of new demand for energy. Uh, state economic development has been actively involved in re recruiting data centers to the state. They don't peak at certain times of the day, it's really just 24-7, they operate um, pretty much at a constant load. So for their size, they place a you know, pretty significant demand on the system. And so they would be primarily served out of um, um, base load plants, which in North Carolina are nuclear and coal plants. Coal. Who'd have imagined that this old fossil fuel, a hangover from the 19th century, would be fueling our internet surfing? that our Facebook posts and emails would be emitting thick black smoke. The internet you think of, you don't think of uh, coal. Not the first thing you think of. Um, 
but unfortunately, many places the internet is being powered by coal. Where the cloud touches the ground is places you know, just like this. This plant is a really old, old school coal plant, one of the larger coal plants on the U.S. East Coast. Uh, and this is a this plant predates the internet, built in the, you know, almost 50 years ago in the 60s. Some of the companies who came down here to North Carolina uh, were attracted by the, the idea of you know, they were thinking short term, not the cost of energy where, where other people were paying. The studies have estimated that this facility is responsible for, for its pollution is 130 deaths a year and over 2,000 cases of asthma. As it burns, coal emits 50 times more CO2 than other fossil fuels. Its ashes form toxic deposits that contaminate the soil and the rivers. Coal is the, the biggest source of global wind pollution in the U.S. Uh, it's, you know, in terms of the fuel, it's what the power plant sector, that's what's driving our global warming contribution. With its 11 coal-fueled power plants, North Carolina is one of the biggest contributors to American climate deregulation. And yet, it's this fuel that is drawing in the web's biggest players. On the map, the equation becomes more apparent. The numerous power plants have attracted data centers to the region. But the energy providers need raw material, coal, which is mined in huge quantities farther north. The Appalachian Mountains of West Virginia breeze in rust and dust. It's the second biggest coal reserve in the USA. 12% of the country's coal is mined there. The history of coal in the Appalachians started well. In the late 19th century, mines and steelworks were the pride of the region and made its fortune. Thousands of laborers worked there and lived in towns named after their bosses. I arrived here in 1967 when I was 11 years old, and it was the perfect place for a child to grow up. The water quality was still pretty good. There was people had built swimming holes up in the mountains. But down the years, underground mines were closed. Coal was extracted from open-face mines, which employed fewer workers. The fossil fuel became a source of desolation and pollution for the area. My grandfather was a coal miner. I mean, he did underground mining. Uh, it was a hard, it's hard work, uh, but it didn't destroy us. A friend of mine said, when is the last time you've been up on the mountain? And I said, probably 30 years ago. And she said, well, you need to go. And I'm like, why? She says, you need to go. We drove up on the mountain, and I told my husband at the time, I said, get me out of here before I vomit, because the entire face of the mountain was just obliterated. It was just gone. I had no clue what had happened. I, I, I was just in shock. To make up for the insufficient yield of coal from underground mines, explosives clear a path for bulldozers which bleed the land on the surface. Hap and Jim had warned us. The mountain has been ravaged from the summit down, but the scars aren't visible from the valleys. Scary look. They 
go to one mountain, they tear it down and take the coal out, and then they move to the next one. The valleys are being pillaged. First, the trees are felled. Then, the mountain is dynamited before being decapitated. The process is radical, as are the effects on the environment. Over 500 mountains have been flattened. Over 1,200 miles of streams have been buried. Um, and that's, you know, these are mountains that will never exist again. The rest of the country has sort of turned their eye, turned away from the problems that are here so we can get electricity. It's as if nature had died. Mining releases the toxic residues built up in the coal over millions of years. As for the explosives, they leave behind traces of mercury, iron, aluminum, and cadmium, which contaminate streams and rivers, killing fish. That's the real price to pay for cheap electricity. That's the dark side to our emails. Ten years after mining stopped on this mountain, despite the efforts of specialists, nothing is growing back. They have sprayed hydro seed on it. Hydro seed is a substance that'll grow pretty much anywhere. It'll grow on a wall and then it dies and then they let it alone. They have planted some trees way up there, but most of those trees are dying. Don't think that, that they will ever be able to properly reclaim that to the ecosystem that was there before. But the digital revolution marches on with its ever greater energy demands. I don't think anybody likes to see the tops blown off of mountains in West Virginia, um, but unfortunately, I think that's been a cheaper way to get at the coal. From our standpoint, we want, we want to give the lowest cost to the consumer. Will our emails end up destroying the Appalachians? In the heart of the mountains, some American students are trying to solve the dilemma. Uh, hi guys, I'm uh, Nathan Jenkins with Appalachian Voices and I'm here today to present to you guys about the Coalfields Expressway. This is... Who uses Google? You all use Google? Who uses Apple? Macintosh. But this new road, like, you know, A new conscience blending ecology and technology from, is perhaps emerging. Uh, even further from... We're gonna do a call-in day, we're looking at a rally, um, to really just like keep pressuring federal highways. There are other ways to create electricity and, and this is, uh, you know, wind turbines on top of mountains. Is it worth it for that to, to operate while we're, we're killing people, uh, you know, killing future generations, while we're destroying the habitats that we have and the water that we have that only is like so far? Is, is, is the internet worth it? I can't stand by and just watch, you know, corporations and, uh, you know, private interest, just do whatever they want. In the U.S., it is such an abundant energy resource. The U.S. is very interested in being energy independent, not having to rely on other countries. So if it's very difficult to imagine a future in which we don't use coal at all. If we don't change uh, where we're, how we're using and generating energy, we are locked into a, you know, a, climate, a rapidly changing climate that it's even hard to imagine how much change we're looking at. We're already seeing it now with the loss of the, the polar ice caps, uh, loss of habitat, you know, forest fires, extreme weather, but that is, you know, we're just at the front end of that. This country needs a revolution and we need one bad. <laughs> really bad. <laughs> we can't get there without the IT sector. Because what we need is, rather than just sort of sitting on the sidelines and cheerleading, it's like, yes, we can be part of the solution. We need you to get down in the field and start getting into the game. 
New technologies consume energy. They also allow men and women to swap ideas. The ball is surely in the big web player's court. Will they be able to put their technologies to the service of savings on energy? Their realm is Silicon Valley in California on the West Coast. The original home of the pioneers, the vanguard, the inventors of IT. Geeks who managed to put the whole wide world into a microprocessor. Geniuses in glasses started by assembling computers in their garages. Then, they established a first connection between two machines at Stanford University, and the precursor of Internet was born. After that, everything moved at lightning speed. Google was founded in 1998, then Facebook in 2004. Googleplex, the main campus. We're an internet company. We're here to make the lives of our users easier. It's all about just giving users the best kind of information they need when they need it and to do it without them having to work too hard. Gorgeous weather. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Located 3,500 kilometers from its coal devouring data center, Google HQ is almost a dream for ecologists. We serve organic, healthy food, mostly locally grown, locally sourced. If they eat well at work, hopefully they'll eat well at home because this is going to be the kind of norm for them. And because we have the Green Grocer program, which encourages people to take home the messages. Googlers, as they're known, don't always work at their desks, eat organic foods, ride bicycles, or drive electric vehicles. The whole of Silicon Valley has changed the way we live, the way we work, the way we play. Um, and it's definitely made my life a lot easier. <laughs> Are these companies which proclaim their green values still seeing through their revolutionary ambitions? Or have their bosses become businessmen like so many others? Every year, the bigwigs of the IT sector meet to discuss their energy consumption. Naturally, Gary Cook invites himself along to the forum. Hey, welcome. Welcome back to Green Grid Forum. The digital economy continues to flourish, and the whole idea is to have conversations about where is it that through collaborative efforts we can work together as we advance energy efficiency. Oh, look at there. Network Anytime that you go on to eBay and you're making a purchase, you're using a data center. So how is it that you can increase the utilization of your assets and then reduce your energy consumption is really what we're all about. So as the Green Grid pulls together traditional electrical, IT, pulls together government regulators, utilities, and it all comes together to make these leapfrog advancements, it, it, it's a win-win. The watchwords are, you've guessed it, Efficiency, productivity, capital, and profitability. Ecology applied to the companies of the digital world. How are we not being evil? How are we trying to be responsible citizens for the environment? Here is the actual grams of carbon that are emitted per 1,000 transactions. And we can start to see it in every quarter the same way. Get the idea? Google is a business, right? And so managing your energy um, consumption is good for business because it saves money. We run a lot of data centers around the world. Um, we want them to be energy efficient. It saves us money as a user. It's not enough just to be efficient. To burn coal more efficiently is uh, not putting us on a path to a solution. Gary Cook takes this as an opportunity to talk to the businessmen. He wants to convince them to run their DCs on renewable energies. Hi, Gary Cook, Greenpeace International. Hi, Gary. Nice to meet you. Yes. So, and the focus of uh, mine has been how much renewable energy. Um, we did all the Google's data centers. They didn't integrate a lot of uh, uh, renewable into those projects. When I first started coming, people were like, oh, Greenpeace is here, what's going on? Uh, so I have no problem you know, coming here, good conversation. We just need to see more action and then let's talk. 
A year ago, Gary set the cat among the pigeons with a report ranking companies in terms of their use of fossil fuel energies. It was the first time someone had revealed the hidden face of the web and forced the sector's big players to face up to their responsibility. The biggest ones is actually one of the worst, which is often the case, unfortunately, in, in life, um, is Amazon. I mean, most people know Amazon for their online stores, but they're actually one of the biggest cloud companies. The big web players, these kids in grown-ups' bodies, haven't all gone over to the dark side. Could these businessmen pave the way for a new revolution? Okay, take the picture, pick. IT sector has always been very disruptive, um, and we need to have the same sort of innovation and disruption of the energy sector as well. And we are tuning the engine. Gary's provocation has worked. Caught red-handed, the web gods have started to act. The race for renewable energies has begun. Google is in the lead. It's building a green data center in Finland which will use hydroelectric power and the freezing temperatures as a natural cooling system. Apple has joined the race in even more ostentatious style. Close to its North Carolina data center, it has built the country's biggest solar farm. From the sky, it's impressive. On the ground, Gary is a little more circumspect. Solar is only, uh, you know, gives the most power, or it only gives power when the sun's out. Uh, and even that is not going to meet all of Apple's demand during the day. So they, it's a big, it's a very uh, big data center just over the hill, and uh, it requires a lot of power. Apple has run headfirst into the major problem of renewable energies, intermittence. When the sun doesn't shine, no energy is produced. When it does, there's plenty, but sadly, current technology isn't able to store it. Apple is reduced to selling some of the solar energy it produces, but it can't count on it. So they're doing, you know, a good start here. What we'd like to see them do more is um, you know, try more of a system change. Stuck in their old energy model, the big web players still haven't come up with the perfect answer. Yet, maybe Internet itself could provide the miracle cure. But a different kind of Internet, one that creates an online network of people and ideas, but also of energy. That's the revolutionary idea of American economist Jeremy Rifkin. Silicon Valley, Steve Jobs, all these young kids. They moved us to the internet, which gave us the communication medium, distributed, collaborative, laterally scale. What happened is we stopped cold after we created the information internet, and uh, we didn't close the deal because we didn't understand the real anthropology of the internet is not just information. It's how information can be used. Information can be used to manage energies that are distributed and logistics that are distributed, then you create a completely different society. The society Jeremy Rifkin dreams of will need two revolutions, one in communication, which is already raging, and one in energy, which is far from complete. And what if the solution had already been found elsewhere? In a small French town, for example. Montdidier in the Somme. 6,500 inhabitants. Ten years ago, the mayor, Catherine quignot le Tiron took the crazy step of making her town energy autonomous. Nous sommes des révolutionnaires pacifiques qui finalement œuvrons pour le monde de demain. She built a solar panel farm and erected four wind turbines, each named after a child from the town. But like Apple, she has come up against the whimsical nature of renewable energies, intermittence. In the daytime, the installations produce too much, and at night, not enough. So in the end, only half of the town's energy needs is covered. Combien 
To attain full autonomy, you could ask the inhabitants to consume less or consume better during times when energy is produced. The mayor called in some experts to work on the idea. Il va falloir qu'il y ait une véritable appropriation par les citoyens de Montdidier de la question énergétique. La préoccupation majeure, ça va être d'aller au cœur des besoins des citoyens et de la traduire en solution qui soit réellement intelligente. On ne veut pas d'une solution technocratique. Nous habitons, je pense, pour la première fois, comment ça se dit, ça vaut la peine qu'on essaye et qu'on contribue à l'effort. Consumers would need to be informed about the vagaries of energy and thus connected by internet to the town's production sites. Bonjour, Madame Le Bonjour, Monsieur Corona. Bonjour. Bonjour, Monsieur. First step, individual smart electric meters will collect energy data from each home so as to study the gap between private consumption and the town's energy supply. Second step, this box will pilot household appliances depending on the energy on offer. On peut imaginer que arrivera sur le smartphone, euh, hop, je suis en pic de production, je produis beaucoup. Si vous avez une voiture électrique, branchez-la parce que c'est intéressant, vous aurez un prix compétitif à ce moment-là. This small box is a first building block of a smart energy grid. In the near future, it could make each person both independent and civic-minded. Today, our electricity is produced in a power plant, then distributed to each home. A pyramidal system with no communication between users. With renewable energies, everyone can produce his or her own electricity. But there is still no communication between homes. Remember, the Internet functions according to a star-shaped model, with computers swapping information between them. We just need to apply this collaborative model to energy so that we all become providers and consumers of electricity with the roles and energy resources shared out on Internet. That's the revolution called for by Jeremy Rifkin. This new convergence of communication energy is, is a game changer. The two coming together is a tectonic shift in power, literally and figuratively, which re makes us rethink the nature of the economy, culture, politics, economic models. Jeremy Rifkin is a networking man. He trots the globe to whisper his vision into the ears of powerful men. China, the European Union, Italy, and now the French region of the Nord-Pas-de-Calais have noted down this so-called third revolution in their diaries. This new way could be an answer to the climatic and economic crises by reconciling progress, ecology, and capitalism. Bonjour, good morning, everybody. The new economic game plan for the world is deliverable. We're going to move it in Leo and this region really quickly first. And we're determined that this region will be the leader in a third industrial revolution to show the rest of the world how this can be done. Thanks. The Third Industrial Revolution aims to create a collaborative society that works together. This decentralized system could also be applied to data centers, the factories of the Internet. Imagine, for example, part of a data center moved into your own home or apartment block. Alors, dehors, il fait 12 degrés aujourd'hui. Ici, à l'intérieur de l'appartement, il fait 22 degrés. Ça, grâce à ces machines-là. Voilà, bienvenue dans le monde du radiateur numérique. Beaucoup de gens ont constaté qu'un ordinateur, ça chauffe. Il y a plein de gens dans leur chambre qui se sont dit, bah tiens, en fait, je me chauffe avec mes ordinateurs. Et puis, en fait, ce qu'on a... Ce que je me suis dit hein, il y a assez longtemps, en fait, à l'époque où je travaillais dans l'informatique bancaire, euh, en fait, on peut en faire euh, des radiateurs électriques euh, à condition bah, de trouver une solution technique intéressante pour le, pour le faire. Servers are no longer stacked up on top of each other in a huge data center that needs cooling. Jaune. Jaune. Tu me le donnes 
Here, they're exposed to the fresh air and are thus transformed into a host of small individual radiators that spread their warmth usefully. Startups, companies, regions, all are building the world of tomorrow. But this revolution mustn't be restricted to the powerful. Each of us must take action at our own level. C'est ça Ah, comme ça Toi aussi, tu te manges la main comme ça Tiens, mange un peu des pâtes, toi. How about I give a quick lesson in digital ecology to my folks? Bonjour, Clotilde. Bonjour. Frédéric Bordage is an expert in Alors, green IT. Ce qu'on va faire, c'est qu'on va commencer par brancher l'intégralité des équipements. Celui-là est déjà branché, c'est bien. Voilà, c'est un peu emmêlé tout ça. Hein. On va brancher celui-là. Qu'est-ce qui consomme le plus d'énergie C'est un... envoyer un mail ou un SMS Un mail, un mail. Un mail Ah oui, évidemment. Ah. Un SMS, c'est... C'est quelques octets, alors qu'un email, ça va être quelques dizaines d'octets, donc ça va être 100 fois plus lourd, en fait. Chaque email qu'on reçoit est stocké le temps qu'on le conserve, en fait. Donc si j'ai ouvert une, un compte sur un webmail X ou Y il y a 10 ans, ça fait 10 ans qu'on stocke inutilement ce, cet email, donc on alimente en électricité des disques durs qui permettent de le stocker. Équivalent à de la consommation de villes de 200 000 habitants qui sont alimentées tous les ans pour rien, juste pour stocker des emails auxquels on n'accédera plus jamais, en fait. Read it, then trash it, and perhaps one data center will close. Chacun, à titre individuel, évidemment, ça va être quelques millièmes de quelque chose, c'est infini des images. Mais on oublie toujours qu'on est 2 milliards et qu'à partir du moment où 2 milliards de personnes changent un tout petit peu leurs habitudes, ça a tout de suite des impacts qui se comptent en gigawatt-heure par an et c'est des centrales nucléaires qu'on ferme. Quoi. Petit lapin est tout excité. Et celui qui est bleu, avec son petit costume bleu, il est où Celui qui crie. Ouais, exactement. Ah non, on n'est pas contente du tout. Ce n'est pas juste, je pense, petit lapin. Elle ne pense qu'à ses... Qu Will my future digital life be stored in connected radiators? Or will it still be kept going on coal? Will we find answers for supplying data centers with renewable energies? The world I'm about to grow up in is shifting fast. One thing is sure, the third revolution won't be happening without me.